Yuji was a poor child who was bullied by his dad at a young age for his lack of talent. He lived in the shadows of his genius sister who made her family rich with her talents. But when a tragedy struck their home, Yuji became an orphan that was trained by evil people to become the coldest elite soldier in the world. His journey, however, was one of the coldest anyone has ever had to witness. His parents always neglected him because he never had the same talent his sister Kazuki did. At a young age, her sketches would marvel her father and her talent succeeded that of famous artists, allowing her to win numerous art competitions and have her work sell for millions of dollars. Yuji grew up avoiding his little sister because everyone made fun of him when he was with her. Kazuki wanted to fill the void her brother was feeling, so she became the only person who would play with him and even teach him how to throw balls. They would spend time together, and his sister supported him through everything, encouraging him to reach for his dreams because he had extraordinary potential. She was the only thing that ever brought him joy and inspired him to become like her. Even the bad drawings he would create, she would treasure them to boost his confidence. Their father, however, continued mocking Yuji's work to the point where Yuji destroyed his own work from embarrassment. On a random day, Yuji met a strange man inside his home who asked him if he would like a piece of chocolate from an interesting box. His father called Yuji an embarrassment, but the mysterious man gives a sly smile. As years passed, Kazuki began hiding her talent and even cancelled her art studies in Paris. Instead, she would spend time reading manga with her brother, saying that he should do this to make friends rather than being lonely his entire life. She doesn't want Yuji to become the same person as their father, and tells him to start working on making some friends. At the same time, her occasional paintings became the sole income of their family, but their treatment of Yuji would get worse. His family would go out to eat every night, but only left cold stale bread for him. The only way he could eat the dry bread was by soaking it with water. Upon seeing this, Kazuki screamed at him to eat any of the food in the fridge, but Yuji tells her that his parents would be mad at him if he did that. Kazuki's sadness grows, apologizing for not knowing how badly Yuji's been treated and yelling at her parents for his mistreatment. Even then, nothing improved. His father would continue to blatantly show his hatred, and his mom began openly neglecting him to avoid his father's wrath. Once, Yuji came home late and told his sister that he was playing with a friend. Kazuki wonders if she's a girl, which he tells her that it was but worries that she would bully his new friend. She tells him that she's trying to determine if his friends are appropriate for him and gets mad at him for constantly making friends with girls. Kazuki's jealousy grows, and she yells at him that he needs to get her permission to be friends with girls. Yuji accepts, and she holds his hand, telling him that she'll find the right girl for him one day. Later that same day, Kazuki asked him if he would like to take a bath with her as normal siblings. Kazuki told him that siblings always do this, and asked him if he'd ever kissed a girl before like they do in the manga. Kazuki kissed him that day, telling him that this is the true love she shares with him, and taught him all kinds of things. Eventually, she enrolled at a regular high school, and joined the basketball team to hide her incredible talents. Her friends became like pawns of hers as she manipulated them but her influence extended to her manipulation of her parents, and that scared Yuji more than anything. But Yuji depended on his sister, wishing that he could continue living that way forever until the day of the tragedy. A bus had crashed into a ravine, and a girl with red hair was the only survivor. Yuji's father fell into depression, and turned to the bottle. His wrath began growing, and his mother began hiding him whenever his father came home. The only thing Yuji would remember is hearing his father yelling at his mom as she would just take it and say, I'm sorry. He became the worst father imaginable. So Yuji and his mother ran away to a new home where she finally treated him like a normal son. He would enjoy her hand cooking and felt like he was living in heaven even if they were broke. As long as they were away from their father, they found happiness together like that. But their peace wouldn't last. And a year later, Yuji's father had finally found them again. He tells Yuji's mom that she will lay him another golden egg, and Yuji tries to tell his father to stop. He couldn't bear seeing his mother like that, but his dad knocked him into the fridge. As this occurred, Yuji stared at his father and was determined to end him. He remembered his sister asking him which hand he would use to kill a man. <laughs> He comforts his mom, and she asks him how far they should run this time. She tells him to run first and that she will join him afterward, giving him her entire life savings. She tells him to run to the train station, and tells him good luck doing it on his own. Without a second thought, Yuji obeys his mom and runs to the train station. But hours pass and he begins hearing the ambulance sirens. As Yuji heads back to his home, he finds that his father had been slashed, and enters his home only to find that he would never be able to talk to his mother again after that day. 
his consciousness faded, and he later woke up inside a hospital with only a note left from his mother. She asked him for forgiveness, wondering where she went wrong, and wishing that he could keep living on. With nowhere to go as an orphan, the mysterious man, Ray became his guardian and began dressing him up as his little sister. But Yuji attempted to ignore his harassing guardian, as he now had walls where he could eat and sleep in. Nights passed, but on one of them, Ray's bodyguard came and was ready to harass Yuji, but met his doom by Yuji's hands. Ray came in, surprised that Yuji was able to follow through with it, and congratulates him on defending himself as he should have. Yuji asks if Ray is mad. Ray told him that he will make him into a strong tool, and sent him to his military compound to train him. His days were spent becoming the coldest soldier, and he happened to be Ray's favorite pupil, but that only caused the other kids to keep bullying him. There was only one person who was kind to him, a girl named Marlene who had no memory of her past. She would treat him and even save her food for him, and he thought that she was the only person he could rely on. Ray would go by the name of Oslo on this island, and would even train using real knives with Yuji. He taught him to rely on knives and to kill before he gets killed. After all, everyone in the world was his enemy, including his own family. Oslo brainwashed him into believing that he was his only ally. The day of the final exam came, and his test was to kill the person standing in front of him. But it happened to be none other than Marlene. He prepared to face off against her, and he began running towards her, punching her and knocking her down. His agility surpassed hers, and his blows knocked her down. Even as she tried to stand back up, he delivered a kick that knocked her back onto the ground. But his memories of his mother being hurt by his father began flashing in his head. He remembered the images he saw that day and his mind began shattering during the match. Marlene used it to her advantage, and kicked him down, standing on top of him and smiling. She began punching him, and Yuji believed that this was all to pay for his sin of ending his father. Before he knew it, Yuji had lost and became a disappointment for Oslo. Inside the jail cell, Marlene comes in to treat his wounds, crying and apologizing for hurting him because she wished she hadn't done that to him. Marlene would continue trying to feed him and being the only one talking to him until the day of her graduation. She told him goodbye and that she would see him again, but that was the last time he ever saw and talked to Marlene. The nurse revealed the sad news to Yuji after her first job, and Yuji wondered if he'd been able to save her by beating her instead of being kind. After graduating, Yuji took on his first assassination mission, and disguised as a maid into a rich man's room. While he was distracted, Yuji managed to complete his mission. His assassinations continued being successful, until one day they broke into Oslo's home. The law enforcement destroyed all of the people standing in their way, and nearly cornered Oslo after destroying all of his security. They discovered an underground passage and a steel door that guarded it. After blowing it up, the only thing they found was a white-haired child sitting inside, and Yuji's white hair fell off. Masako looks at the boy, realizing that she's found something interesting. Oslo was able to escape through the water. Masako decides to take Yuji with her to Japan. But JB decides to follow her along because she needs to supervise the two of them. Inside the hospital, Asako commands him to get out of bed within the next 40 seconds. She hits him in the head and continues threatening him, so JB yells at her to be more gentle with the kid. But Yuji has never experienced kindness and wouldn't know how to respond, so Asako treats him like garbage and tells him to cut this out. She grabs his face, saying that she's going to be his god from now on. Inside her home, she commands him to change his dirty clothes, but what they see shocks them in their place. His body is filled with scars and gun wounds, and he hasn't eaten in weeks. Asako tells JB to bring drinks and food for them, but at the dinner table, Yuji doesn't eat. Instead, when a fly comes by, he crushes it with his hand. As he stares at the fly, his mind freezes and he screams in fear and throws up. Asako comes to comfort him, telling him not to puke in her disgusting home. He sleeps at night, and Asako realizes that his mind is more broken than she thought. Because while she bathed him, she saw two gun wounds, countless knife gouges, and broken bones. Asako thinks it may have been easier for him to just unalive, but she vows that she will protect him as his god. The next morning, Asako is sitting on top of Yuji attempting to force him to eat, but Yuji begs JB to save him. Asako tells him to quit sweet-talking the dumb blonde because she's so lonely and stupid she'll listen to anything. You're a victim! Mm. JB tells Yuji to toughen up, but he tells her that she has no idea what Asako's been preparing for him. Inside the kitchen, JB takes one good look at the food and realizes that she's holding Deer Plot. She runs faster than Sonic into the bathroom and spends the rest of the afternoon cooking food for Yuji. Asako thinks that he will still be stubborn, but when JB sticks her wet blonde rice in his face, 
he decides to eat it out. Asako gets Yuji his own puppy that will now be his partner and tells him to take good care of it. Yuji decides to name it John Doe, which is the code name for a corpse in the military. Masako looks at him playing with his puppy, and JB thinks that this is the first time she's ever seen him act like an actual kid. A few months pass, and Asako decides to quit her job for the intelligence agency. JB warns her that she'll be imprisoned or executed if she just quits like this, and wonders if Yuji is the reason she's been changing. Asako reveals that she's become afraid of dying because she has to take care of Yuji, but that she's also beginning to lose vision in her eye and can't be a good sniper anymore. At night, she goes outside and sees Yuji staring at the stars and crying. Yuji continues growing, and as he goes on a run, he remembers Asako's words that he needs to run faster to be popular with the girls in elementary school. As he continues growing, Asako tells him that running isn't enough in middle school, and that the bad boys who are capable of fighting are the ones who get girls. She begins training him to toughen up, teaching him to be a person who is strong and fights for the right reasons instead of using his strength to harm others. She teaches him to use whatever he needs to win, so he calls out for his dog to bite her. Finally, she teaches him that fighters are only popular in middle school, and that girls only like smart people in high school. If only that was the case for me. Asako makes him read all kinds of books, whether it's manga or non-fiction, telling him that she'll buy him everything. After all of his reading, he finds Asako cleaning her gun while smoking. She asks him if he's ever fired one of these before, and takes him to the wilderness the next day. He fires his first shot from 300 meters and completely misses. However, he's determined to get it in the next shot, and Asako promises him a present if he does. He aims and fires, hitting the target. As promised, Asako gives him a case with the number 9029, which was her agent number. This sniper rifle will be Yuji's from now on. However, she tells him that he needs to follow his path without ever giving up. Yuji asks Asako if he could call her his master, because to him, she wasn't a mother or a sister. She was least of all a father. The only thing she became to him was a master. During the winter, Asako gathers ammunition for Yuji and they go out together on a hunt. He aims at a deer, and Asako tells him to not waste a single bullet because they will cost the taxpayers money. However, Yuji falters and is unable to pull the trigger. Asako realizes his weakness, and doesn't blame him because he's been through more than any other kid. On a random day, Yuji wakes up to his dog barking but finds a bear has broken into their home. Quickly, Yuji rushes to his bedroom and takes out his gun, but only comes back to see John being bitten by the bear. He takes aim to save his dog, but his mind blocks him from taking action, and he fails to fire at the bear. As the bear leaves, Yuji builds up his courage to go take his dog back. His life of fear will no longer stop him from saving the one he cares about, so as he runs to and is ready to aim. He slips on the snow and fires, clogging his gun. The bear notices and is ready to eat him alive, but Yuji uses his knife to slash at the bear. The bear knocks it away in a single hit, and Yuji's entire mind flashes with the words to end the bear. With a simple stick, he blinds the bear's eye and gets his gun, pointing it down the bear's head. A rustling comes from nearby and he sees a couple cubs walking towards his dog because it's their food. Yuji wonders why his dog, why his family, has become their food. He wonders why it couldn't have been any other life that had nothing to do with him, and screams in pain as he fires. He later comes back to Asako with his dog's collar, and she asks him what happened. Yuji couldn't kill the bear in the end, and tells her that no matter how hard he tried, it was no use. She hugs him to her chest, telling him that it's okay. They spend the sunset burying his dog's collar, and Yuji wishes he could be as strong as Asako so that he can die happily. Asako tells him that his life isn't just some meaningless excuse until he dies, and that she knows he can't kill anything unless she gives him a direct order. However, she reminds him that his food and shelter are all given by the taxpayers, so he is indebted to making sure he can protect them. In the old days, Asako tells him that he wouldn't have been able to die until he's killed 10 enemies. But now, he must save 10 people. She tells him that it doesn't matter if he's too weak to pull the trigger for his own sake, but that he should never hesitate when pulling it to save another's life. A few years pass, and Asako reveals to JB that Yuji has completed plot development. JB wonders what kind of story she's referring to, and Asako tells her that she was the story. She tells her that Yuji was able to experience the rising action when he removed her plot armor and climaxed all over her face before his plot experienced the falling action. JB yells at her for doing something that she should have never done, 
but Asako tells her that's why her plot will never be developed. After all, they're a man and woman who have been living together for two years. Yuji remembers being in the shower with Asako and her asking him when his birthday was. Yuji told her that today was his birthday, so she asked him what he would want for his birthday. Yuji tells her he wants a nicer guardian. She bites him and he blushes, so she tells him that she'll give him the best present of all. He asks her what it is, and she says she will be the present. What do you mean by that? That was how his first time went, and JB goes on to ask if they've only done it once. Asako goes on to say that they've completed plot development every single day since. Yuji comes back with the ramen, and JB pretends like they weren't talking about anything because she's afraid Yuji heard them. Asako tells her that this is why she's never experienced a climax. She asks her to give him a try because she's trained him well, and tells her to have a few drinks in the meantime. After a few bottles, Asako calls to give Yuji a special mission. Now that JB is completely wasted, she wants Yuji to give her a good time. He pulls her to the bedroom and doesn't let her go. He calls her by her first name, and instead of eating the meaty dinner he was preparing, she ends up getting devoured by his meaty rifle. <laughs> Sensational. A few more years pass, and Asako's health begins declining. Yuji notices her hands are shaking whenever she begins drinking, and begs her to stop because she's all he has left. No matter how many times he asks her if she's sick, she would lie to him and tell him that she wasn't, but he noticed something was wrong with her body. She began zoning out more and more, and her health began causing her to miss work. It got so bad that when she got a call, she was unable to even answer the phone, so Yuji had to pick it up. On the other side, an agent was commanding Asako to respond to the current mission and invoking Article 9, causing her to be imprisoned if she refused. Because of her current health, Yuji began taking on her jobs. A few days later, JB asks Asako why she hasn't been talking to her on site, but Asako admits to her that she wasn't the person doing the job. JB yells at Asako for having Yuji take her jobs the same way Oslo forced him to. But Yuji insists that it's his decision because he wants to one day repay Asako. JB worries that Yuji is getting carried away by Asako's lifestyle, but Yuji insists that this is the way for him to find meaning in his life. JB yells at Asako and takes Yuji outside, firing bullets in her ceiling as she's leaving. Over the river, Yuji reveals that he told Asako that he wants to be just like her, and wonders if JB knew Asako's response. JB tells him that Asako probably wouldn't want two of her in this world, but is happy that she has Yuji looking up to her. She asks him one final time if this is the path he wishes to tread, but he tells her that this is the only way he could ever repay the debt he has for them. After they leave, Asako tells him that he's going to America to attend military school. A big black man asks him what he's in this sh** for, and Yuji reveals that it's because he ended his parents. This startles him, but Yuji says he's just joking. After being certified, Yuji tells the man that he should buy his own shoes if he doesn't want athlete's foot. The soldier wonders how he knows this, and Yuji reveals that he's been a soldier since he was a kid. But the man thinks he's just joking. In the bedroom, the man calls him an Asian boy, but Yuji tells him he's Japanese and introduces himself as Yuji. The man mocks him and calls him Yujin because he looks girly. But Yuji corrects him and tells him that his crazy music is making him a deaf moron. The man takes it in good sport and introduces himself as Danny Boner because he has a big black c Danny calls Yuji shorty and Yuji gives up. The next day, the commander slaps Yuji in the face because he's raised by Asako, so he should be grateful and honored by the slap. What? During training, Danny lags behind and asks for Yuji to wait up, but he tells him to stop all the smoking. Even as they swim, Danny's big muscles gas out faster, and Yuji tries to encourage him. He asks him what he would do if a girl with big plot was drowning, and this inspires Danny to swim faster than a shark. During lunch, Danny makes fun of Yuji's new face, but Yuji tells him that their commander has been a pain recently. Danny tells him that he thinks she's a gorilla that would never get married, but Yuji calls her attractive. Danny thinks that Yuji is insane, but Annie comes from behind and tastes Danny's big punisher. Sorry I meant Annie punished Danny. During range practice, Yuji shoots every single bullet on point which surprises the commander, as Asako, the best sniper in the world, was the only who used to accomplish such a feat. A girl hears their conversation, and oversees Yuji being awarded first place in sniping. She comes up to him later at night asking him to talk with her. She introduces herself as Millie, 
and Yuji wonders why pushy women are the only ones he gets. Next to the swimming pool, he restrains her after she punched him until she apologizes. He recognizes her as the second place sniper and asks her what she wants. <laughs> Millie tells him that she meant marksmanship, and they go to a range together. With her weapon, she tells him that her father used to hit these targets when they were out of range, but believed that all of it was just him being drunk and lying. Yuji's first shot misses, and she tells him to chill out because he only has six shots left. Yuji asks her what the color of the sky is today, and takes aim and fires, hitting the target. He tells her that her father probably wasn't lying, and Millie finds a person she can trust. After that day, his training was complete and he was sent overseas for his final exam. Aboard the ship, Danny asks him what he bought with his money because he was able to get a car, but Yuji reveals that he only got a lady's watch. Danny makes fun of his watch and Yuji's Asian persuasion, saying that Yuji's been giving Millie the small hour hand while Danny could be giving her the long minute hand. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE Millie hears his vulgar language and kicks him. While they argue, a random weirdo is playing a dating simulator with his little sister and loses his mind as she takes her plot armor off. They wonder how he's shamelessly doing this and wonder what language he's speaking. Yuji is cultured in this subject and knows that he must be a fellow man of culture from Japan. Day after day, Yuji was commanded to do as he was told and build his confidence, until one day they were deployed into the actual battlefield. Inside the forest, Yuji looks at his squadron, a former car thief and thug from Arizona, a poor girl who used to sell herself in restrooms, an anime otaku who wants his sister, and finally, a sniper that can't kill anyone. They were the most useless group in the entire army, but Danny interrupts his thoughts and asks him if he would like to get that bird for food. Yuji takes aim and fires, hitting the bird, but begins throwing up. He wonders how he would handle killing a person if this is what a bird did to him. Inside their tents, they're introduced to their acting commander on the field. Their days of setting traps began, but one night, Yuji realized that enemies were coming for them. They get in position as the battle begins and Yuji fires to neutralize the enemy, but throws up after shooting. His friends continue fighting on the front lines as they wait for reinforcements, but Yuji begins faltering. His commander tells him to close his eyes and realize that all of his friends, his only family, may die. The ones he's spent this entire time and shared laughter and food with them. All of them are his family fighting to protect him from the enemy. The commander tells him that the enemy isn't human, and that it's okay to hesitate when killing people. But he shouldn't sit back and watch his family dying helplessly. His commander tells him to kill them and that he will assume full responsibility for it that he gives him permission to do it. One by one, the enemy fell down, and even as Yuji hates it, the commander continues counting the amount of enemies being neutralized. Not a single shot is wasted, and the entire enemy front line gets annihilated. Yuji continues wanting to battle, but the commander stops him, telling him that everything's fine now and that he can sleep peacefully. After falling unconscious, Yuji wakes up in Mila's lap who comforts him. She tells him that everyone's been saved by him, and that they will always support each other and that she will never let him die. After a while of being on the battlefield, his resolve became stronger and he wasn't influenced by the constant battles and explosions around him. Danny, however, begins losing sight of what this war is about and what winning even means. But their deployment comes to an end and Yuji survives that terrible background along with all of his friends. As he leaves back to his homeland, Danny comes up to Millie and asks if she'll be fine with her boyfriends leaving her. She tells him that they said their goodbyes yesterday and destroyed their relationship. So Danny swoops in and asks her if he can make her feel better by destroying her p***y with his 10-incher. Stop it. Get some help. Millie stares at the window where Yuji was and prays to God that Yuji will find happiness in life and be blessed in everything that he does. In the gathering twilight, Yuji boards a plane home. It was a windy day when he returned to his familiar mountain, and the paths were just as he remembered. His welcome home was Asako, and she thinks that he looks more mature now. After great plot development, Yuji tells Asako that seeing her face was the first time he's ever been glad that he's alive. Yuji tells her that he doesn't know what to do with his life, but that he wants to give every bit of it to her. After that, he finished his final training after the Vancouver International Airport, and that was the last time he'd ever seen Danny's friendly smiling face. As everyone cried, Yuji wondered when Danny's joke was going to end. A few months passed, and during one of Yuji's missions in Spain, JB called him to come home immediately because Asako collapsed. 
The only information he'd received is that it was a chronic condition from being shot many times in her life. Doctors tried to treat her, but her body had become extremely fragile from all the substances she was forced to take during her deployment. Once he arrived, JB told Yuji that Asako's been drifting out of consciousness very frequently, and that she's been dozing off longer. Yuji sees Asako, apologizing for taking so long to get home. She holds his hand, and Yuji asks her if she is dying, to which she says that she is. She apologizes for always lying to him that she would stay alive with him. He begins crying, telling her that he hasn't learned everything from her yet. But she tells him to stop crying and to be more of a man like she taught him. She tells Yuji that she's finally understood what her life means now that she's about to die. It was her resolve that allowed her to save him and spend her life with him. Yuji cries, telling her that she was his only saving grace in a life that betrayed him at every point. He tells her that he wanted to believe in her till the end, because she was the only reason he had for living. Asako tells him to live his life for his own sake from now on. After all, that's the type of man she's always wanted him to become. He tells her that he can't, and that he only survived because of her. Every time he was cold she was the warmth he could turn to. He wonders what type of future it's going to be without her, but she encourages him to find out for himself, to keep fighting and struggling, and to be the man she always wanted him to become. She tells him she's accepted that she's going to pass on, but Yuji asks her who gave her permission. Even if it was God, Yuji wants to fight him off to keep her by his side. Asako tells him to stop being so silly. He spends the rest of the time with her, and she tells him the stars are so pretty today. Yuji looks outside, and tells her that the stars are very pretty today. Asako tells Yuji that she remembers him looking out at the stars and crying when he first came to live with her. She asks him what he was thinking about, but Yuji tells her that he can't remember. Asako laughs, telling him that she knew his response. She tells him that she's tired, and asks him if she could go to sleep. Yuji tells her that she can go to sleep, and after that, Asako never woke up again. Her body was taken away by JB's subordinates, and Yuji tried to pull himself together by the time she was cremated. JB let him know that they found a bullet among the ashes, and Yuji thinks that it really befits Asako's personality. Weeks pass, and Yuji wonders if he would go to the same place as Asako when he meets his doom. But he will not allow that to happen yet, not until he's fulfilled his promise to Asako of saving five people. This is his only purpose left, but someday he wishes to see her again. Yuji sleeps on the floor for days, but JB comes to slap him awake. Staying in that cabin where Asako's presence still lingered was filling Yuji's head with thoughts he shouldn't be thinking of. So JB took him into her apartment to live with her. Living together, they would compensate for each other's wounds and supported each other, or at least they thought they would. During dinner, JB tells Yuji that he can ask for anything, and he tells her that he would like a better toothbrush because the current one is too soft. Flustered by this, JB asks him if he's been using her toothbrush this entire time, and Yuji tells her that she's been brushing her mouth with his long and rough toothbrush so it shouldn't matter. JB realizes how dumb she was, and buys two more toothbrushes. Yuji apologizes, but she tells him that she should have expected him to be as crude as Asako. Sadly, Yuji became a thing that reminded JB of Asako which bothered her, and neither of them knew how to connect with one another once that happened. She would stay up and ask him if being with her would remind him of Asako. She cried one night, apologizing because it's too difficult for her. As days passed, JB began coming home less and less. With all the time he was left with, he wondered if he should go on a journey. He remembered Asako telling him that if there's a path he doesn't know, he should stop and try to find his way through it. Even when making wrong choices, he should try to broaden his view and discover what lies ahead of him. She promised him that they would go on a journey together on her motorcycle, but she never made good on her promise. Yuji gets up, telling JB that he's going on a journey wherever the wind takes him, and promises her that he will come back. Yuji was surprised that she let him go so easily because she will be lonely at night, but drives on Asako's motorcycle. Asako! Days pass and he meets with people from all walks of life while camping. He continues going through the rain and even messages Julia that he loves her. Somewhere in the middle of the road, his bike breaks down and he has to tow it. A man comes up to him and asks him if he would want a ride to somewhere safe, but Yuji says that he's just an idiot running around with no place to go. The man laughs, thinking it must be nice to be young, which changes something in Yuji. At nights, he wonders if being young is what he's missing, and emails JB that he's going home. He opens a drink to give to Asako's grave, and apologizes that he came back without understanding anything. Yuji apologizes for breaking her bike, 
but he hears Asako asking him if he had fun. He tells her that he enjoyed his journey, but wonders what he should do now. He feels like this journey has taught him what he's missing, and thinks that he might need to just have another take at being young and going to a school. It was at that moment that Yuji stopped telling JB his life story, and received an instruction from the military commanders to complete a mission under Article 9. They remind him that failure is not an option, and rejecting this mission would be the same as treason. Yuji gets in prone position, aiming directly at his target. He hears the music box that Oslo used to play for him and the words that convinced him to become the man he is today. Yuji has confirmed the target in his scope, however, he begins realizing that this is the worst case scenario. Watch this next video, till next time my fellow legendary plot masters.